What's up, my friend? How are you? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? You look great. I'm fine as well. Thank you very much. Uh, it's it's been a long time. I, I feel like we have been uh, quite inactive for the last uh, three or four weeks. Mm. But in our defense, we were also very active before that. We had a lot of great guests lined up, so I think it's uh, it's fair enough that we took a a, a small break. But I haven't seen you since like uh, before Denmark Open started, right? No, uh, no, we did the we did the episode with Laksha, and uh, since then we we haven't seen each other uh, in person. Um, now we're here online. Uh, it's good to see you again. Mm. But uh, yeah, as you mentioned, we were we were really on a on a good streak with uh, with Pranoy, with Lisija, and with uh, with Laksha Sen. Uh, but here strong we are lineup. back again. Very strong lineup, but here we are back again with a boys only episode. And it's going to be amazing. We have a lot of stuff to talk about for sure. There's been yeah, a lot I mean, going uh, on. Yeah, there's been a lot going on the last uh, three or four weeks uh, with uh, with Denmark Open, French Open, and Hilo Open as well. Um, so we had a lot. To, we have a lot to cover. I'm not sure if we're going to to cover it all, but let's see. Uh, let's see what's on the menu today. I know that you sent it a, a great uh, like set list for this episode. So uh, I think you should uh, you should you should start it out with the first topic. What do you want to talk about today, Hans Christian? But you don't want to like do the normal welcome. Hey guys, what's up? Welcome to Badminton Experience episode. Blah blah blah. blah. Sorry, sorry about that. I'm I'm oh, out of oh, shape oh, here. So, oh, uh, oh. so to to the audience, to the people watching, <laughs> thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of the Badminton Experience uh, with your two hosts, as always, myself Anna Santonsen and Hans Christian Wiesinghus. Uh, we are glad to to be back with another episode um as mentioned a lot to cover a lot to talk about so i uh, hope that you will stay tuned throughout the entire episode hope you will enjoy it uh, as always please remember to subscribe to the bamson experience here on youtube and uh yeah follow us on, on instagram as well um i guess that was a pretty good intro so it was perfect the only thing that's not perfect is for me right now your your uh, webcam seems to be uh seems to be off. I don't know if it is for the viewers as well, but I can't see you right now, but yeah. I guess that's just how it is. I can hear you. I at don't least. know. I don't know. Can, maybe Oliver can uh, Oliver uh, can our, see me. Our producer says that he can still see you, so that's perfect. Anyway, it was a good uh, intro on us, and uh, I think Thanks. actually the first topic for today will just have to be, we need to know what's going on with you. Like, you have a new haircut. We haven't seen you <laughs> in uh, practice for quite a while. You uh, you didn't play Denmark, French, Hilo. Uh, and I saw also in the Danish news that you said your 2022 season is over. So like, what what's going on with you? Is it the same injury that was uh, troubling you back in uh, in the summer in Asia? Or what, what's going on? Yeah, uh, yeah, it actually is. It's, uh, it's a groin injury. Um, I think it's also known as a like a classic football injury. Um, mm. So it is uh, kind of like the same as uh, as was troubling me earlier this year. Um, so yeah, this injury has been a pain in the ass for me uh, mm. this year. Uh, it has kept me out from nine tournaments in total or something like that. So it's not necessarily a um, very, very serious injury or, or an injury that's very, very hard to deal with. Um, so it just uh, requires a bit of patience and uh, rehab, rehab and stuff. Uh, so I just feel like the timing of my injuries this year has been absolutely terrible. Uh, so right, right before we went to Asia in, in the summer, leading up to the five uh, tournaments there, I got this injury like one week prior. And um, this time I got this injury like a little less than two weeks prior to Denmark Open. So... The timing was just, um, yeah, quite unlucky once again. It happened in, in a practice session. Um, yeah, suddenly I just felt like, yeah, uh, the muscle just uh, pulled or something like that. Yeah. So uh, it's, uh, yeah, it sucks. It sucks. I had to withdraw from all the tournaments and stuff, so. Yeah, it's definitely, it's it's really, really bad timing, all of it. And with, like, the amount of tournaments that has been cancelled this year still, it's uh, it's even worse because there's not been enough for you to, to produce 10 results, right? So you're going to you're gonna feel a, a big hit on your ranking uh, when we come to January, right? Yeah, definitely, definitely. And that's, um, yeah, I mean, I, I could have uh, I could have maybe stepped on court uh, being, like, 70 or 80% ready to play. 
Uh, but if I did that, I was just risking redoing the injury once again. And I've tried that a bunch of times now. So yeah. I, I just came up with the com- conclusion that I needed to stay very patient and I needed to take my time to heal this injury and also yeah. uh, like build this area on my body, build it very strong and build it very flexible again uh, so that I avoid uh, running into this injury again and again in the future because it's uh, yeah it's uh, it's it's not good and it's very frustrating and uh, I need to I need to fix this issue not just momentarily but um yeah. forever so uh, hopefully yeah. hopefully after these few months I can uh, like build uh, the area so strong and flexible and everything that it uh, hopefully won't happen again um but yeah it's been a super frustrating year for myself and uh, the last 6 months especially has been super frustrating um I think I started out as number 3 in the world this year next year I will probably be I mean 20 to 30 something like that I'm not 100% sure um so yeah I'm I'm starting I'm starting from scratch all over again um it's a, it's a new beginning and uh, it's a uh, on one hand, it's it sucks and it's super annoying, but on the other hand, it's also interesting, and I'm quite excited to like start over. Um, mm. Right now, I'm 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 in Aarhus in my hometown. I'm I'm back at my parents' place. I'm driving in uh, my brother's old car, uh, picture 108. Uh, you you know, so it kind of feels like I'm I'm back to 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 zero again, and it's uh, it's it's kind of fun to be honest. So I'm I'm uh, I'm looking forward to like to, to start over again. It's not really a, a jet set lifestyle, that's for sure. No, I'm I'm back. I'm back to I'm back <laughs> to scratch. It's uh, yeah. it, it's it's kind of fun, but um, yeah, that that was a, that was a bit about me. It's just to sum up, it's going in the in the right direction, and uh, I will be back soon. Uh, I'm working yeah. really hard. It's, it's good to hear injury. that it's not it's it's not something that will uh, like it doesn't concern you long term. So like when you get to January, you're pretty confident that you will be back in shape and ready to compete in the uh, January events in Asia. Yeah, definitely. I'm definitely uh, confident that I will be ready for that. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I'm uh, just taking one day at a time. Um, not uh, rushing, rushing back uh, too too uh, too fast. Uh, I'm taking my time, and uh, I will definitely be ready for for January and super motivated as well. So, but um, too, yeah. but that was a bit about me. How about how about you? Uh, I, I followed your results in the last few tournaments, and uh, not not yeah. as uh, as hopeful. I I assume. No, well, I played well in all three tournaments, uh, but I lost first round all three of them. So that's of course never fun uh, to lose first round every time. Uh, had some tough draws, obviously, with the uh, Jonathan Christie in both Denmark and French Open and Kunle Vitsitsan in uh, in Hilo. Um, yeah, so like on on one hand, I'm I'm actually quite happy with the level I showed on court, but on the other hand, it doesn't really give any ranking points or. Uh, much confidence when you can't really wrap it up in the end. Uh, I had a very good chance to beat Kundabut in Hilo. I won the first game and was up 15-9 in the second. Uh, and yeah, then lost it from there. So yeah, that's it's been a little bit tough also knowing that when January comes, my ranking will will also plummet. Uh, I think I will be out of uh, top 32 for sure. I, I will for sure. Um, but I just hope I can enter the tournaments in January uh, because that is... And, older ranking they will use so hopefully i can still enter those tournaments and then the the good level i show on court hopefully i can uh, convert that into a few wins in january so i'm i'm positive in terms of uh, my level but yeah it's it just sucks losing first round every time i'm uh, i'm sure you can relate to that and everyone uh, at home watching can relate to that i uh, i i tuned into your match in uh, in hilo against kunlabut mm-hmm. i think i tuned in uh around the time where you were leading uh, in, the, in the second game. And, and from there on, uh, it went downhill. Uh, yeah. So it's your fault. Well, I, I can I can blame you. Yeah, I mean, may, maybe I'm, uh, <laughs> I was bringing some, some bad luck or something. But I feel like I have experienced that so many times that you see on the live score that, that some crazy result is about to happen. And then you tune mm. in. And from there, it just switches totally. Uh, I don't know. There's something yeah, well, uh, going on there. Yeah, well, I think for good players, they uh, they just have a way to kind of find a way to, to figure it out uh, when you get into the matches, right? And obviously, Kundalwood is a world-class guy, so he didn't give up, and he uh, he actually started playing a little bit faster. He changed his game, his game to be a bit more aggressive as well. Um, so it's also credit to him that he changed it around. But I guess that's why it happens every now and then, that the good players, they don't just give up. They uh, they keep searching for ways to, to turn it around. 
probably. Makes sense. Makes good sense. Yeah. But yeah, should we just should dig we... into uh, to the uh, like first topic that's not about you and me? Let's do it. I want to start with the Denmark Open because uh, that's the first event we played since uh, since the last time we uh, recorded an episode. And I think for me, like the thing I uh, I I thought most about afterwards that was uh, most spectacular was actually seeing Victor lose. And it's not because I particularly enjoy watching that, but just because he's been so unbeatable this year. And he was basically demolished in that uh, quarterfinal against uh, Lo Kin Yu. And we ended up having uh, Shi Yuki as the, uh, as the winner in the single. So I thought that was, uh, that was by far the most remarkable uh, thing in, uh, in Denmark Open. Did, did you watch that match between Victor and Lo Kin Yu? No, I I didn't watch uh, I didn't watch it live, but I have uh, seen some highlights afterwards. Mm. Uh, so from what I can understand, the shuttlecocks were very fast at the Denmark Open, uh, mm. which might be uh, suitable for a player like Lo Kenyu, who is extremely fast, very explosive. Um, mm. So what I'm told is that they were lifting a, a lot of um, a lot out of out of the baseline, and, and Lo was the one controlling the net the front court and uh, I think that uh, that led to to his victory but uh, maybe you can uh, yeah. help me out yeah. a bit yeah for sure definitely I, I agree that's what happened uh, Loken Yu was much better at the yeah playing the tight net and it was a match about that who did that the best uh, and it was fun to see they played it each other again in French Open uh, the week after and it was a complete opposite because the shuttles were slower the conditions were slower and Victor managed to actually keep the game away from the front of the court so it was uh, it was a lot more physical battle and a lot more playing looking you uh, just basing him uh, basing him on the uh, on the back line all the time so it's just it was quite fun to see like how much it actually means with the with the speed of the shuttles, if they're slow or if they're fast, and definitely Victor, he's uh, he's so tough to beat with those uh, slow shuttles. But it was, uh, in some ways, also good to see in Denmark Open that he is still human. Also, in terms of uh, of the way he uh, he carried himself on court, that he, he looked frustrated at Denmark Open. Uh, it definitely uh, it didn't suit him that the, the shuttles were so fast and difficult to control. He also had a tough build up. No doubt about that, becoming dad for the second time just before. And so there are some explanations um, for why it went the way it did. But I think with the year he's had, I think it was good for all men singles in the world to see mm-hmm. that, uh, yeah, he is still uh, he is still human and he can still be uh, shaken up in uh, under the right circumstances, at least. But I mean, the good good thing for Victor then is that 95% of the time we play, the shuttlecocks is extremely <laughs> slow. So <laughs> Yeah, that's true. That's true. I'm also but not I think, sure I that... Think it's, yeah. I think it's it's fun that there is a uh, different speeds of shuttlecocks that there is different mm-hmm. playing conditions uh so it's not just the same all the time um just i mean al- also for also for for the players it's 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 uh, for me to see it's quite fun to to try out different uh, playing conditions um slow shuttlecocks is is also fine it's very it's a very physical game um mm-hmm. when the when the shuttles is like that um but it's also fun when the when the game is maybe at a higher speed and you are forced to to be attacking and controlling the net and stuff. I think that's also very enjoyable to watch instead of just the the long rallies um, that goes on for forever. So yeah, yeah, definitely, it promotes different uh, different skill sets uh, depending on what kind of uh, conditions you have at the event. I was hoping this year at Denmark Open would be different because we played in a new arena compared to uh, the previous years, but. I like. I felt it was a little bit easier to play there, but it was still, yeah, just too fast for my liking. It's definitely not something that promotes uh, uh, my my skill set. That that's for sure. But yeah, I still did okay. But the 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 men singles final, as as you just mentioned, it was between mm-hmm. uh, Li Cijiar from Malaysia and Shi Shiuki from uh, from China, mm-hmm. and I think it must it must have been a long time ago since. Uh, China uh, versus Malaysia in a men's singles final. I mean, Lin Dan and Li Chung Wei mm. have been playing so many against each other. Uh, but uh, I mean, it must have been like maybe Li Chung Wei, Ching Long, or Li Chung Wei, Lin Dan, something like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe when Lin Dan won Malaysia Open, I think that was one of the last ones he ever won. Actually, I'm I'm not sure who he played in the final, but something. 
tells me it was maybe Chen Long. Yeah. Was it Chen Long in the was final? Ch- uh, it was Chen Long. I think it was Chen Long. Yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right. Yeah. So yeah, I'm not sure when the last time it happened, but for sure it's been a while. It's been a while since there's been uh, a Chinese winner, I guess, of uh, one of the big events. Yeah. In uh, in men's singles. But yeah, it's. What did I, you I make of uh, what? What did you make of uh, Shio uh, level? Was he like back to his his old self or? I I actually don't feel like he is uh, completely back. I I feel like his level is still pretty much pretty much up and down, uh, even in the matches and in the tournament. Denmark Open, even though he won it, I didn't feel like he was very consistent. Um, like of course overall he has to perform at a higher level, but there was a, there was a lot of uh, ups and downs during his matches, also in the final against uh, Li Shijia, and we saw it again the week after in French Open. He was uh, he was very tired. Uh, he looked very tired when he played there and also lost early. Um, so I still think he he has some catching up to do to get back at his best, but of course he proved in Denmark Open that when he is playing some of his best, his his top level is still uh, yeah good enough to be one of the top two, three, four, five guys in the world for sure. Uh, and I think it's it's definitely great to have a Chinese player back. I, I think we need those in the, in the top of uh, World Badminton. Um, so, yeah, I, I think we've been uh, missing it with uh, with him out. No uh, no offense to Lu Guangzhou and, and Cao Yunping, but they are, they're very good players, but I don't see them as a top five potential, any of them. But they have they have quite a lot of players by now. China, I saw the 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 draw for Australia Australia Open. I think they have maybe like five men singles players in in the mm. draw. So they they have a bunch of of good ones. But Shi Yuki is is definitely the the best of those guys. Mm. And and I for me to see, he's definitely a like a, a top five player on his best days. Uh, yeah. Maybe maybe he's he's right behind uh, Victor, uh, mm. so I, I feel like he could be one of the absolute best. He definitely is for me to see. Yeah, when he can win the Mag Open without uh, me being uh, f- feeling like that he's back at his best, then that says a little bit about the uh, the level he uh, he has. Um, the other thing from from the Mag Open on your notes is uh, <laughs> there was a mixed doubles that. Uh, that got a lot of attention, I th- and I think we were, you and I were mentioned in a, in a few comments on Instagram saying that this is a topic for the badminton experience. You should talk about this. Um, I did not see the match, but I know it was a mixed double between Mikkel Mikkelsen and uh, Rege Sebu and Sing Shi Wei. Um, and uh, help help me out with the, uh, with Huang, the Huang, Yak- Huang Yakshan, I think. Okay, you yeah. pronounce it like that. I'm not sure, but uh, I think everyone no. knows who it is. The best mixed doubles in the world. Uh, from and uh, and uh, Xing Shi Wei was like uh, called for for serving too high. How many times? Yeah, a lot of times in the first and the second game. I think maybe eight or nine times in the, in the second game. It was a lot of points uh, for the Danes just on the, on Xing Shi Wei's uh, serve. Yeah, being called too high. And I, yeah, I think on Twitter as well, we got so many comments that we have to discuss this. Uh, and well. There's there's some people complaining that it's uh, it's bias and uh, these uh, umpires they shouldn't be allowed to uh, to um, to be umpires against Chinese players again and I know the Chinese Federation even uh, complained about that as well um, and I'm I'm not so sure I I agree with that what I what I find really frustrating about a match like that where suddenly all of a sudden you get called eight or nine times is that the day before. He wasn't called the next day. He wasn't called the next tournament. He wasn't called. So like, there's no, no consistency in what's called and what's not being called. Uh, but I don't doubt for a minute that the serves that were being called were probably too high. I also saw s- photos of those two uh, serving in other tournaments where it like it looks like they're really high, but in general. All the doubles players they serve to the limit or over the limit, and it's not just the Chinese; it's also the Danes, the Malaysians, Indonesians. It's everyone who's doing it because there's so much to gain from serving ac- uh, above the the uh, the line. Um, but just normally, you only get called once or twice, maybe in the start, and then you lower it a little bit, but you go back to normal. And I, I think that's what what we can take away from the match is that it's so frustrating for everyone when all of a sudden an umpire chooses to call it every time. Uh, which you can't really argue against because if it's too high, it's too high. But it's just 
it leaves everyone with a frustrated feeling, right? Even as a spectator and as a player. And so that that's where it really, I, I just don't understand why it, it has to be this way. It, but it frustrates me so often. Yeah, I agree. Uh, it, it's, it definitely needs like, um, I mean, the service rules uh, were, were changed like a few years ago or maybe more than a few, maybe five years ago or something like that. But it's, it's definitely not really working still. It's like, um, it comes down to to the service judge. Uh, I don't know if it depends on on if the service judge is in a good or a bad mood or something like that, because as you say, the men's, the, the doubles players probably serves the same way every single time and then yeah. one match they don't get called at all or maybe a, a whole tournament they don't get called at all yeah. and then suddenly they run into to a service judge that's calling them every single time and it's yeah. it's super frustrating because they probably don't do anything different um yeah. so i think it, it leads one to think if the uh, if the umpire really wants one pair to win over the other and that's uh, if if that's the case, that's definitely not good. But uh, I mean, I don't. I, I ex- absolutely have no idea uh, how it can happen that often because I really do not believe that Ching Chi Wei was doing anything different from what he usually does. So I don't know what to make of it, other than the system is uh, is not really working. Yeah, I just missed you for the the final two seconds there. But yeah, I I I also don't understand like what what changes from that first day to the second day and i agree that i don't think he did anything different because wh- why would he would he do that in a uh, like a second round match all of a sudden it just doesn't make sense um like in some ways i would wish that bwf told the umpires to to start calling everything in all tournaments because then i think the doubles players would actually collectively have to lower the serves if they got called all the time every time they serve too high but i don't think that's going to happen uh, and I, I really don't see that this is going to change for the foreseeable future we will still have matches every now and then not necessarily with the chinese but with a different pair where they suddenly get called all of a sudden we saw it at the danish nationals last year in the final of women's doubles where alexander boy and meta polson uh, they got called in the final 15 20 times they just came back from uh, alexander just came back from the olympics where she wasn't called at all um and yeah then all of a sudden gets called all the time so it's frustrating but i just don't see it changing uh, anytime soon we will still have these matches uh, every now and then um, yeah but it, yeah it's yeah. uh yeah <laughs> Yeah, I mean, maybe there is like a mutual agreement between the between the judges that if it's just a little bit over the line, we let it mm. slide. But then yeah. every once in a while, there is an umpire who's actually following the rules hundred yeah. <laughs> yeah. percent, and then it's yeah. uh, then they just call absolutely everything. Uh, mm. I think, as you mentioned, they have to do it one way or the other: either call mm. everything or let it or let it slide yeah. unless it's yeah. Uh, yeah. super over the line. Um, but I, I yeah. think the problem with like making it more uh, consistent is that like we have so many different umpires at all the events so some umpires they only they only umpire two or three international events a year or four or five or whatever but it just means that we we go through a lot of different umpires so it's very difficult to like align how they should call it because when we go to malaysia there will definitely be a lot more malaysian umpires compared to if we go to Denmark Open, where it will be more of the European umpires and so on, that makes it very difficult to to make like a, a consistent uh, way of uh, of calling the serves worldwide. But I would say I, I'm I think the 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 service judge on this match was uh, the 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 woman named Sarah. I think his name is Sarah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And 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 we do not have to go into deal details, but. I have I have a history with 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 her being my, the umpire of one of some of my matches as well, and I have been quite frustrated with her to to say the least. Uh, so we do not do not have to go into details and uh, talk about old matches, but maybe you should take a look at some of the uh, some of the umpires on on the road if they are disturbing the matches too much or if they are able to to be a good umpire or not. So I I'm just saying. I have experienced a few things with her as an umpire. I wasn't happy with it. And um, yeah, and that's, we, we, that's all I can say about that. <laughs> we need to get her on so she can defend herself against you. That will be a, a juicy episode. <laughs> <laughs> I, I but mean, it, I'm quite it, sure. I'm, uh, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say that it wasn't the only uh, drama in that match. Uh, I'm sure you also heard about the, uh, like the, uh, the drama between the two coaches, right? 
the Danish coach and the Chinese coach. Because obviously uh, the Chinese coach, he was very unhappy with all the calls. So between the second and third game, he uh, he put his hand on the, on the uh, umpire and said something. Obviously, we don't know what he said, but it's pretty clear that he probably was complaining about the, uh, the service uh, umpire. And uh, Thomas Stango, the Danish coach, he got pissed about it and uh, and ended up pushing uh, or shoving this uh, Chinese uh, coach away, which is, of course, not okay. He shouldn't do that. Um, but yeah, that, that also uh, created quite a bit of uh, quite a bit of drama. And I, I know Thomas, the Danish coach, he had to apologize uh, both to BWF but also personally to uh, to this uh, Chinese coach down in uh, in France. But what, what did yeah, you make he, of that? He, he, <laughs> I mean, I I know I know Thomas well, and he's like, uh, he he he's a good man, but he also has a he has a, how do you say it, some temperament. Uh, mm. He he's like when he was a player and and in his younger days, he he could definitely be uh, be a bit aggressive. So he got a bit physical during that mixed double there. Uh, yeah, it it yeah. wasn't really like a hard hard uh push it, it, it was a little like a little shot or something like that yeah. but uh but still i mean you shouldn't get physical <laughs> but uh sure. yeah that's i i think that's i mean it's clearly wrong to to get physical uh yeah. he should just have a uh, stick to to his players and, and, mm. and go and talk to them but yeah i don't know it's it's obviously something that you that you don't do and i guess that's yeah. all you have to say about that yeah, definitely, and I think Thomas, of course, of course, he also he does it to kind of show that he's there for his players, and it. On the other hand, it also it worked for the Chinese coach because he complained to the uh, to the umpire, and after that, there were no calls in the uh, in the third game. Uh, so yeah. I think that's also like w- one thing that should not be allowed is uh, is a Chinese coach actually touching uh, the umpire in the interval. That should also not be uh, not be okay. We should not. I don't say he's hitting him or anything, but we shouldn't be touching or being physical at all with the uh, with the umpire say, during the match. You shouldn't be allowed to put pressure on the umpire that way. But it's definitely not an okay reaction. I'm not trying to defend Thomas. Of course, he should not uh, yeah shove anyone away or push anyone away. Uh, I want to make that clear for sure. And I know Thomas also agrees. Uh, but yeah, in the moment, uh, he got carried away. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, uh, it, I mean, it was, uh, it was going to be a huge, huge win for the Danish player if, if they could win the match. So, of mm. course, I guess he was fired up as well. And uh, yeah, some stuff like that can happen in in the heat of the moment. Uh, for me to see, as mentioned, you shouldn't get physical, but at the same time, it it wasn't really that bad. It, it was a, a a tiny, tiny push. Uh, so yeah, it's. It's nothing. It's nothing crazy. I mean, you and I have have done way worse stuff in practice and and throwing our rackets uh, after each other and stuff like that. So, yeah, no, that's, but that's, um, true. that's true. One one more thing that was uh, a bit controversial from from the Denmark Open, and uh, I wasn't really aware of what what was going on. But but suddenly yeah. on my Instagram, it was like a bunch of bunch of uh, people uh, tagging me in different photos and stuff and saying that Anna Santos is from Norway, Anna Santos is from uh, Finland, Sweden. And I was like, yeah. why, is, why, why is this uh, popping up <laughs> on my Instagram suddenly? And then I, I found out that it was at the men's doubles prize ceremony. Uh, mm. I think, uh, was it Kevin and Marcus or was it Alfiana and Arianto that was it- presented as being from... Malaysia, right? Yeah, the crazy thing was that it was both pairs actually. At least the both the, pairs, uh, wow. the announcer started off saying like second place from Malaysia, Kevin Sukamulio, Marcos Gideon. And then with the winners it was uh Alfian and Arianto, also from Malaysia. So wow. yeah, she did it she did it twice in a row and yeah, the, the social media just exploded. Uh, the the press officer from Badminton Denmark actually called me uh while I was in uh in France. Because he said that like the the social media was it, it went crazy and like they, they didn't really know how to handle it uh, because yeah as both you and me know and as the viewers probably also remember from all England uh, when all the Indonesian team was uh, was uh, withdrawn from the tournament because of uh, COVID on the, on the plane they arrived with the, the Indonesian netizens they can be uh, pretty intense when they feel uh, um, something is is unfair. And for some reason, this one just really, like, it really hurt them somehow. Uh, I think it's because it was Malaysia. I think if it had been Korea or uh, yeah any other country, I don't think it would have been as bad. But I feel like there's a lot of tension in terms of uh, competition between Indonesia and, uh, and Malaysia. Um, and, like, of course, 
it's crazy that it could happen. And actually the announcer at Denmark Open, uh, she's been doing that job for many years for the tournament. And it's not like she doesn't know the players. She knows all the players. Uh, so it's just, uh, yeah, I think in English, uh, you would call it like a brain fart. I, I'm not sure how it could happen. I know she has a, uh, she has a paper with like a, uh, a schedule of what she needs to say. And then it's just blank with the uh, names and the countries. Then she fills that in. Uh, by hand uh, so she has the same uh, same template for all the five categories and she just fills in the names uh, by hand uh, whenever she needs to do the ceremony and for some reason she wrote down Malaysia instead of Indonesia and then uh, read it out loud uh, twice in a row uh, yeah but I, uh, she actually sent me a message because I sent out like an apology as well uh, to all the Indonesians saying that like we should move on and uh, yeah she sent me a message to ask me also to to convey her apologies to the players actually if i met them in france because uh, she she felt terrible about it of course mm. i mean it's it's obviously a mistake that that shouldn't happen but at the same time it's human makes mistakes and um i i think you're right right about let's say she said uh, that the players were from denmark or something it, mm would have may- maybe been uh, been been different but because there is probably some rivalry be- between Malaysia and Indonesia mm. it uh, really annoyed them mm. but um yeah it's it it shouldn't happen for sure but it's it's it, it was a it was a stupid mistake but one thing that that kind of annoys me is like suddenly uh, we as as the danish players are getting attacked and i'm like yeah. I mean, dude, I I have no idea what you're talking about. I mean, I don't know what's going on here. I didn't even yeah. see it. it. It's not. I have nothing to do with it. And suddenly, I'm being kind of like attacked on on yeah. my Instagram yeah. and in my in my DMs and stuff. And it's just I've experienced it a few times, um, mm. where it's like, it's just it's just weird to to blame the the, the players that has absolutely nothing to do with it. But yeah. I mean, at, at the same time, I under I understand that they got very frustrated and it, it kind of hurt them, uh, but uh, and that's that's yeah. understandable for sure. I think it's also a cultural thing in some way because, like, if if one of us uh, went to the podium, which is very unlikely at the moment, but if we uh, do that in the future at some point, and uh, the announcer says Anna Sandson from Sweden, like, of course you would think like, what's going on, but it's not like you would get absolutely pissed and it's not like the Danish fans would start uh, just complaining to everybody and saying like, how disrespectful is that? Like here people would, would kind of laugh it off. Um, so I, I think there's some cultural aspect there that, that we don't really understand in the same way as Indonesians apparently uh, do for, for them. It seems to be a bigger deal than it would be uh, for us for sure. Yeah. 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 You're right. You're right about, right about that. And that's, that's just one thing that you need to respect that uh, mm. here in Bamton we are dealing with a bunch of different culture cultures, and there's a there's there's space for everyone, and we need to respect the different cultures and stuff. Uh, mm. So, as as mentioned, it's this mm. this shouldn't happen. That that's yeah. for sure. But uh, hopefully, hopefully it was just uh, hopefully we can move on from here. A good ex- a good example of uh, something like this is I remember playing a team match uh, some years ago. Where um, my team from Aarhus was facing the other team from Aarhus, uh, where Anna's uh, score uh, Rasmussen is playing the men's doubles player. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, yeah, I think it, it it was his first time playing for for that club uh, for like many years. He grew up there. He was playing there when he, when he was uh, when he was young. Uh, so it was kind of like a, a big day for for him and for the club that he was now finally returning to to his club, and. Um, and when we, all the players got presented, he was like the, the last player to to get to get announced. Uh, and the uh, the speaker in the hall was really like hyping it up, and he was really really putting a lot of energy into this uh, announcement and saying stuff like, "And now he's finally back where he belongs," and stuff like that. <laughs> and then, then when he then when he announced his name, he went. Brian Scoro Rasmussen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's just uh, unbelievable. And it was it was so fun. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're still on. I just, you're still here. I just push push something here. I'm still here. Yeah, yeah, but it, it was just it was it was so fun that he he said Brian instead yeah. of Anders. I mean, it's yeah. it's not it's not even close. It's not even even like Andreas or something like yeah. that. It's just yeah. totally off. 
and and I, and I mean, Anas is, I guess, just laughing about that uh, mm. to, to this day. It's, it's super fun, and we still laugh about it when we talk about it sometimes. Sometimes we even call him Brian. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I think on, <laughs> on Instagram, I think Tim and Brian is pretty commonly used about the uh, Kim and Anas, right? So I think I think that's where the Brian comes from, right? It's from from that team match uh, back in uh, in the Danish <laughs> yeah, league. It is. Well, yeah, it's, it says a lot about the uh, the cultural difference uh, in terms of that for sure. And you need to be you need to be careful there, and you 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 don't want to offend anyone. Uh, mm. But uh, it's 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 difficult at times. You really need to be careful. Uh, mm. Just in general, when we conduct ourselves out in let's say Japan, that's also super different from where mm. we come from. Uh, and the last thing we want to do is to offend someone. So, mm. uh, and this is not about, you know, the, the name uh, or the country and stuff. It's just in general, how we conduct ourselves and our humor and the way we inter- interact with, with the other players. It's way different from, yeah. from how they maybe do it in, in, in a country like Japan or something like that. Mm. So when we travel out in the world, we also try to like be respectful and, and behave mm. in another way that we might would back back in Denmark. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely, one hundred percent agree. Should we uh, move on to the uh, French Open? Talk a bit about that one. Let Let's do that. Um, I, I kind I, of have I, a I, feeling, actually, honest that when you're not playing tournaments like these, you try to not really watch a lot of it live. Is Is that correct? Can you still hear me? Yeah, I can still hear you. Are you putting it on silent or what are you doing? Hello? And I can yeah, I can still hear you, Arnas, and I can still see you. You're I'm, not frozen I'm or back. anything. It's it's because that's some sometimes I feel like these air, air, airpods is like um it's like how do you say this? <laughs> it's like falling out of my ears. Okay. okay. So sometimes I, I'm plugging them back in, yeah. but when I do that, uh, I uh, I start, you know, Siri. Ah, okay, yeah, yeah, and then it pops up on the computer and really annoys me. But yeah. but anyways, I'm back. Uh, back to your question. Um, I mean, yeah, you're you're kind of right. Uh, I I try to, I try to to watch it still, but at the same time, I don't really want to because mm. it's like hurting me quite quite a lot emotionally. Uh, I mean, I I try to not be not get so much exposed. Uh, mm of badminton uh, because i'm dealing with some i'm dealing with some some stuff with my injury and it's like mm. very very frustrating for me uh, mentally and stuff so when i watch badminton a lot i i kind of get like i just get like a, a bad feeling it's like uh it's like it just reminds me of all the things that i'm missing out on um mm. so I, I i try to watch it because i want to learn from from what i see but i really mm. do not enjoy it uh if, if i'm not playing to be honest um yeah well yeah that makes sense makes sense so did you watch anything from french open did you watch the final we had a, a like a, a full danish uh, men's singles final that's of course big for us so we have to uh, we have to talk a little bit about that yeah even though we would wish we would wish it was the two of us right but not gonna happen <laughs> yeah it wasn't it wasn't uh yeah i, I watched the final uh i also watched uh when victor and rasmus played in denmark open uh hmm. The, the week before that um i watched the final it was pretty one-sided victor was uh controlling it throughout the the whole match and i, I think you saw like quite quickly in the first game that rasmus was uh, in for for a very very hard time uh, mm. in this match uh, victor was super solid um mm. not giving anything away in the beginning and i think that's one thing that uh, i'm very impressed about uh with victor is that there's just He's just super solid in, in those finals, and obviously he, he has a lot of uh, experience at, at this time. But I remember like uh, the Olympic final. I, I kind of had the feeling like Victor was a, a big favorite, but still, it's the Olympic mm. final. Who who knows how he's going to deal with it? And he was just mm. like ten and twelve, super solid. Yeah. He just won it easily. Yeah. Uh, and then again, when he had to face Momota in Malaysia, it was kind of like, okay, that's that's interesting. I'm, this mm. this could be a fun match. And he won with a twenty-one four, twenty-one seven. Yeah, yeah. The same, the same in in the World Championships finals against Kunlevud. Mm. Kunlevud mm. was playing a good tournament, and it was like, okay, I mean, still Victor is definitely a big favorite, 
but it's going to be interesting to see if Kunlevud can do something uh, in this match. He just wanted, like, I mean, he, yeah. in the first game, five was it like 2 one 5 or something? Yeah, yeah. So, I think he, he has found a way to stay super calm in these situations. Mm-hmm. He's he's super calm and, and, and very, like, focused and uh, making the right decisions and not giving a lot of weight to the opponent mm-hmm. uh, for for most of these uh, ma- matches. And I think it comes mm-hmm. down to, to experience and confidence, mm-hmm. of course. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Did did you watch any uh, anything from his semi final against Naraoka? Victor against Naraoka. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I think I think I watched a little bit of that. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, did. I just I just found it like I didn't watch all of it, but I I started watching at the end of the first game where Victor was in control, uh, and I, I just found it so much fun. Like in the uh, in the interval uh, at eleven in the second game, I think Victor was leading something like eleven four, and again complete control. Naraoka couldn't really create any points. It was just clear that the like the coaches were telling Naraoka that he could not just keep playing it around. He needed to just try and go full out attack. And I was just like, that, that that's a terrible idea when you when you don't have a great attack, which in terms of world class level, I don't think Naraoka still has the, the best attack. I just thought there was no chance that he could score any points if he started doing that. And he came out of the interval just attacking on everything, trying to push the pace, and it was like he was playing against the wall. When Victor is feeling confident and uh, yeah, there's nothing uh, that really gets under his skin, then it's just uh, in those conditions, it, it's basically impossible um, if you don't have the tools to put it on the floor. I was just I was being uh, entertained in the, in that small period in the uh, after the interval in the second game. But what about uh, what about Rasmus? Because Rasmus he played uh, two very very good tournaments. Uh, he he lost to Victor at the demo goal, but he played a very very good match and he definitely yeah. had some chances in that second game. And then he went on uh, to French and and went all the way to the final, uh, which was yeah. very impressive. Uh, I I haven't because of my injury I haven't seen him that much in training, but the. But the few practice sessions I had with him uh, leading up to, he, he looked like uh, he looked like he was in good shape. I mean, he's mm. I know Rasmus from from I mean since we were like five or six years old, so we have been growing up together and training together since we were very young. Mm. Uh, he's always been like working extremely hard, and he's very very mm. dedicated. So so, uh, but it's it's good to see that it's it it's uh, it's paying off it seems like mm. i feel like he was uh, he was super solid in french open maybe you saw him play a bit more than i did so yeah but no 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 particularly well for him i think he was just extremely uh, first of all extremely fast uh, and i think he was very consistent in terms of not giving away a lot of easy points and uh, so he because of his speed he's getting a lot back and uh, because he's in great shape, he can just he can also keep on like attacking and adding the pressure. I feel like he's not the guy who's like hitting the lines all the time with his attack, but it's more like the the added pressure all the time because he keeps the pace really high because of his his uh, quickness around the court and yeah, the fact that he can just keep keep adding that pressure that uh, that win, wins him the games. Uh, I, I saw his match against uh, Kunlebut that he beat in the quarterfinal of French Open and in the end Kunlevut he just completely died like he had no answers in the end uh, he could put it on the floor in the start of the match but because he kept on getting them back and he kept the the pace really high it seemed like uh, Kunlevut he kind of slowly just lost his uh, his power and his his way to to create the points and in the end he honestly he, he couldn't score points at all so so Rasmus basically just had to keep the shuttle going and keep the rally going then in the end the uh, kunda would, would be uh, frustrated and uh, and do a, like a really bad choice uh, that was either a mistake or then rasmus could punish it so i think for sure like his his form his condition uh, must have been great because he was uh, he, he was killing opponents uh, on the way uh, yeah using his speed and uh, playing at a high pace from what i saw at least I think that's uh, that that very interesting because I would say that Kunlevud is a player that really is a, is a good runner himself and he's really good at playing uh, pl- playing long matches and and rally style. Uh, he's mm. he's also like uh, it feels like he's he's in quite good condition as well. So for, for Rasmus to win a a seventy eight minute match against Kunlevud mm. where it ended in in that way is uh, is quite impressive. So, uh, but yeah, uh, Ra- Ra- Rasmus is. Rasmus's condition has always been very, very good. I mean, mm. he's always been a good runner, 
Mm. And also when we was like doing cardio, mm. uh, when we were growing up, uh, when we were out running in the forest or on the track, he was all, always one of the one of the very very best runners. So mm. he's always been in good shape. He's always been super strong. I remember when we were like maybe 16, seven years, seven, 16, 17 years old, I think he could bench press like a hundred kilos. I mean, uh, uh. that, that, that's not necessarily good for badminton, but just to say that he's always been like, uh, in general, yeah. in his whole body, like super strong and, and, yeah. and in good condition. Yeah. But, um, but I yeah, would I also think... say that he's all, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I was just going to say that. I, I think that is one of like his big qualities is that he's a hard worker. Like, uh, he, he's very good at, uh, just keep going, keep pushing, even when it starts hurting and there's a, like lactic acid in your legs and stuff like that. Like he can keep on going and like he, he doesn't want to give up. I think that's really one of his uh, his biggest uh, skills that he's a, he's a hard worker uh, all the way uh, to the bones, actually. And 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 he's he's also extremely valuable in in the in the training because he is such a hard worker and he's mm. he's there in in training giving it his best uh, every single time uh, and that's super valuable to have a guy like him in the training and I think he kind of like for for our training setup in in Copenhagen he was he's he's kind of like the guy who could take over from from Jan a little bit because mm. Jan was also yeah. a very hard worker and uh, doing his best every single day in training uh, and even though they are not the same player they have different styles but they still have some similarities when it comes to their overall condition and their speed and power as well so i think rasmus is, is a good guy and very valuable to have in training and i think me and uh, victor has um it's really been good for us to have rasmus uh, mm. on the court and we us three has, has been on the court a lot for, for, for the past few years um, mm. and uh, yeah he, he's He's been extremely valuable uh, for us. Uh, he's been very valuable for me my whole uh, my whole life because we have been growing up together in the same school, practicing together since we were like six years old. So mm. to have that competition with him where he yeah. gets better than me for a few years and then I surpass him for the next few years, you know, that, that competition has been driving both of us to, to do better all the time. And so... So it's it's good to see that he's uh, he's he's getting some great results here. I'm, I'm very happy for him. Yeah, definitely. Kudos to uh, to Rasmus for a couple of great tournaments. Uh, there were two. I will come back and I will, yeah. I will I will I will come back and and, and kick his ass though. Yeah, you're make, pretty make used to that, right? Like usually <laughs> when you guys play each other, then it's uh, it's you on top, right? I mean, it's it's the fun thing is that it's really switched a lot over the years. So I think when we started out. Like uh, like young juniors, I was the best. But then for for many years, he was the best. But okay. then around the time that we got senior senior players, I think he was out for a while with some injuries. And mm. when he came back, I was like the best, and probably ha have been the best ever since. Maybe maybe he's better now, so maybe I'll have to to catch up with him. So it's a uh, it's good competition. It's back and forth all the time. But uh, it's like it's like um it's like a, like a a very like brother like relationship we know mm. each other so well we hate to lose to each other mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, it's definitely yeah. pushing both of us in the right direction yeah yeah that makes sense makes sense uh, one thing i want to mention from the french open and this is from a category that we basically almost never touch on is the women's doubles and it's simply just because uh, like the winners of in french open uh, it was uh, pearly tan and uh, tina I think it's Moralitharan or something like that. I'm not sure how to pronounce her last name, but Pearlie and Tina. Uh, I think it was just great to see them actually getting some success. I've watched a little bit of their women's doubles in the past, uh, and I think they actually play some very uh, fun and aggressive women's doubles. And we haven't seen a top pair from Malaysia uh, since uh, Wang Pei Tu and uh, Chin uh, Ehui, which you probably don't know, but it's uh, it's like probably close to 20 years ago now 15 years ago that they were actually a world number one at uh, at one point uh, so i think it was just great to see like a proud badminton nation like malaysia who has just got their first world champions in uh, ever in the men's doubles they have lisi ja and now they also have a women's doubles who can uh, who can win some of the uh, like the big events i think that's amazing to see and i think it's really good for the sport so uh, i thought they deserved at least to get mentioned on uh, on the badminton experience it can't get much bigger than that can it no, it's good to see. I saw no, Lee Chang Wei yeah. posted uh, posted something on his uh, on okay. his Instagram as well as well about uh, about these two girls. Um, 
Yeah, it's. I mean, to be honest, I didn't. I didn't watch mm-hmm. anything. No. Uh, I only watch watch that match from French Open with uh, with Rasmus and Victor. But other than that, I didn't watch anything. But I've seen that they have been doing quite well recently. Mm. Not not only in French Open, right? Yeah, 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 definitely, definitely. And I also didn't watch them during French Open. It's only from matches I've seen parts of in the past that I uh, I know a little bit about the game. But uh, yeah, I can also be honest that women's doubles is not the category I'm watching the most. That's uh, that's for sure. Um, but that may also means you did not see the uh, like the epic comeback in the mixed doubles final. No, I heard about it though. But but yeah. tell me more. Yeah, you should go watch it uh, online. It's on BWF's YouTube channel, I think. But yeah, uh, Huang Yekyung and uh, Sheng Wei, who we spoke about before from Denmark Open as well, they uh, made it to the final. And they were down 2016 in the third game against Selena Peak and Robin Sabaling. Uh, a pair they've actually lost to before. Uh, it's, it's pretty crazy. This is the only European pair, I think, that has ever beaten them. Um, so they were, yeah, they held four match points to do it uh, once again. I don't know how. I didn't watch the full match. I only watched the uh, the ending. Um, but yeah, somehow they uh, they found a way to get out of trouble and uh, and win it twenty two twenty. And even though like I like a story like that, a comeback win, I I feel so bad for uh, for Robin and Selena from Holland. Like it it must hurt. Yeah, so bad. I know Selena really well. We've been teammates for uh, for a lot of years. She was a guest at my wedding as well, and uh, she always stayed in our house when we were playing uh, team matches uh, when we were still on the same team. And like at the same time, I was really pleased that she made the final of French Open, but I was almost also crying for her that they uh, they didn't really uh, cap it off with a title. Uh, I I I can I can hardly imagine how they feel after that. Have you have you tried anything like that, losing a, a title that way? Yeah, I, I, I guess I have. I guess I've tried it uh, a few times. I can't really remember of one single mm-hmm. occasion, but yeah. I mean, have, having a big lead or a big opportunity to, to do well in, in some tournament, it, it probably happens like a bunch of time for every mm-hmm. single player, but it, it rarely happens that you have like four match points to win such a big <laughs> title and do such a big upset against the, the best player in the world, I assume. Um, and then and then lose those four match points. It it, it must have been like uh, heartbreaking for sure. And it's it's one of those matches. I I assume that they they are going to think about that one for for the rest of their lives. That's uh, I'm quite sure about that. Mm. Yeah, yeah. It makes such a difference if you like if you get that title or if you don't. And obviously, Robin and Selena is not a pair that is winning a lot of the seven hundred fifties or uh, super one thousand. So, this would be like a career defining uh, win if they had won the title. But on the other hand, it's also like they, they must also be happy that they almost beat the best pair in the world. They made a final. They they play at a really high level. But I don't think I would be able to shake off either that feeling of. Uh, letting it slip away no i mean no i uh i i i have i have a few uh, of those in, in the last uh 12 months uh you know matches that i almost had that i would have loved to win and uh, i only thing i can tell you is that it really really hurts and uh yeah there's absolutely if... nothing you can do 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 about it afterwards other than just try to deal with with the pain and move on is there like one match? If there was one match you could choose in your career that which you lost, that you would have won instead, which which one would you choose? I'm pretty sure for Selena and Robin, it's it's gonna be this this one when they look back at their careers. But if you could choose one, way you could change I think, the result. I think uh, I have three matches that that comes to mind. Uh, I would the um, the World Championship semi final against Lo Can Yu. Uh, mm. the uh, Olympic quarterfinal against Ginting and then the uh, Thomas Cow semifinal against uh, Jonathan Christie. Yeah. Those, those three uh, it's definitely matches that I really, really, really wanted to win. And I think mm. they could have made a huge difference for, for the outcome of the, of the tournament. Um, and uh, I, think, I think I would go with the Olympics, uh, but, mm. but those three is definitely up there. Yeah. Um, it's what about also you? Three. Yeah, it's also three uh, tough, uh, tough losses for sure. Uh, I th- it is. think it like it's not like the one I would choose is actually not one that hurts like a lot because I wasn't that close of winning it. But uh, like if I could just choose uh, randomly, I would uh, I would say the semi final of All England when I lost to uh, Chen Huwei. I won the first game and then I lost something like 21-15, 21-15. So it wasn't that close, but 
I kind of felt like I actually had a good chance, especially in the start of the second game, uh, if I had the pushed a little bit harder and been a little bit more disciplined i think i could have had a good chance of winning that semi-final uh i, I don't think i would have won the all england even if i won uh, the semi-final because it was lin dan in the final and he was in a in a playing mood where no one basically had a chance but all england has always been like the most special tournament for me uh, and i think when i when i retire it would have been really nice to have that experience of actually playing an all england final even if Lindan would have toyed with me like he did with Chen Hui in the final. Uh, I'm pretty sure it would have been an uh, outstanding experience. So, I think I would, uh, I would, I would uh, pick that one for sure. I, I, I feel like it has happened like multiple times where you, you lose like let's say you lose like a, a second round or a quarter final, but the other matches in the draw is like turning out in a way where you start thinking that. Like, oh, damn, if I just had, had won this yeah, one, yeah. then I should have yeah. faced that guy and I could have won against him. Uh, and then I would have faced this guy in the, in the yeah. final or something like that. But it just, there's no point in thinking about the, the no. even though it's difficult to, to, to don't do it, it's, there's just no point in uh, thinking about it. It's just, it's just how it is. I mean, you, you play badminton for 15 years, you get so many chances. Yeah. Just to move on, just, just move on to the next one, even though it's uh, extremely difficult at times. Yeah, yeah, true, true. Let's uh, also move on well, to the next one. Ah, unless you yeah, uh, had a good question um, for me there. No, I was about to do the same as you, just uh, just keeping the uh, the conversation uh, rolling in the right direction. Uh, I mean, it's it's a lot of us to to cover three tournaments and maybe also an upcoming World Tour final. So, um, if there's one thing that we should talk about from the High Low Open, uh, it's some mm. more controversy, uh, some more <laughs> yeah. drama, and. Uh, I saw this one as well, um, and uh, it, it was uh, during the men's singles finals between uh, yeah. Anthony Ginting and uh, Cho Chen Chen. At 22-22 in the deciding game, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, Ginting was, was, uh, was faking a net kill, but then blocking it instead. Cho got it back over, but the umpire said that the shuttle hit the floor, even though for me to see, it's quite obvious that it did not hit the floor. Uh, I think I think there's no doubt about that, right? Yeah, yeah. From the uh, the the replays we've seen afterwards, it's it's very clear that he uh, he got it back before it it didn't hit the ground, which was what the umpire obviously said that it did. And he was he was like furious, furious, uh, uh, Cho Chin Chin. Understandable yeah. because it's yeah, a yeah. crazy time to to get a call like that uh, against you. Um, but uh, Ginty yeah, won he... the match. Then he won he won the next point. Yeah, yeah. As Cho, he had just survived six match points. So uh, yeah, I think it was six, or was it four? It was somehow. I think it was six actually, because I think it was from twenty sixteen. He survived four, I love and then he survived one at twenty one twenty, and again at twenty two twenty uh, one. So he survives six match points, and then he gets this one uh, against him, and uh, yeah, then loses on the uh, the seventh uh, chance. Uh, but did, did you notice uh, the the gesture? Uh, Victoria Cow, the uh, physiotherapist of uh, Cho. Uh, did for him yeah uh, I loved it I loved it just making the heart <laughs> I, I'm not sure how I would handle that on court like I, when you're so frustrated and pissed and then you look back at your coach and she's just sitting there with a the heart like she's she's so sweet but yeah I'm, I'm not sure if that would be the correct way for uh, Kenneth to handle it if it uh, happened to you or me <laughs> No, I mean she's uh, she's she's definitely a fun character um, yeah, yeah I'm not 100% sure what her like uh, what her title is i mean is is she her like coach but also like a uh, physiotherapist or yeah. i mean i i see them together all the time i'm not 100 percent sure what 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 her title is i'm pretty sure that her title like officially is like physiotherapist but uh, of course she helps with everything like warm-up uh, cool down preparation and also coaching in that situation I, I'm i'm not sure how much uh like badminton stuff she actually uh, says in, in the coaching situation or if she's just reminding him about stuff they agreed on before the match or what uh, I'm, I'm not too sure about that but I'm pretty sure that like the official title is more of a, a physiotherapist I would say of. um there's there's two things uh, that I would say about uh, about the, the high level open first of all I think you really really need to respect Cho Chin Chin he is such such a hard working player and he's been he's been he's been on the road for, for, for quite a while now and he's just time after time again he's just 
giving his absolute everything and he's such a tough guy to beat and he's he's uh, not really one of those guys that you talk a lot about it's more like uh, Victor and Dissija Lo can you but Joe is always there and if there's an opportunity to to do a great result he's he's really taking it I, I feel like so yeah. I just want to 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 give uh, credit to George and Chen for always being such a hard nail to beat and just uh, fighting so hard for for every single tournament and um, and second Ginting is uh Ginting is back Ginting with mm-hmm. with another win he also won the mm-hmm. uh, he also won the Singapore Open uh, this summer, right? And he's yep. uh okay. So uh, okay. we just we just had some uh, technical issues, uh, but I think we're back again. Um, I think the, the what I was uh, what I was saying was uh, it's Ginting is back. That was what yeah, you Ginting, were saying. G- Ginting is uh, is back, and I think his uh, results is uh, is really up and down. But then suddenly he hits his level and uh, produces uh, something extraordinary. Uh, he is a crazy, crazy good player on his best days. But uh, I think he he lost the first round in French Open to Samir uh, Verma. I don't know how how did how did he do in Denmark Open? Hmm, that's a good question. I actually don't remember. I'll look it up now. I will look it up. I don't remember. He probably the, didn't make the... it too far, since we don't remember. I'm I'm quite sure he didn't, but the point is that he is a uh, he's just a funny player because he is what I will call like a like a title like a title chaser or something like that. Yeah, he's not yeah. ne- nece- not not necessarily that stable uh, the whole year around, but but he is a he is a guy that's always there and always uh, able to 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 grab a title if he hits his absolute mm. best. So uh, yeah, he's a uh, he's. It's interesting. You 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 can never like uh, you can never you underestimate him. To, yeah, you you always have to take him very seriously, uh, Anthony. Mm. Uh, so, yeah. and also a very good guy since we have him here on the podcast as well. Of course, so he's, he's a, a he's, he's a house friend. He's one of our favorites. So uh, yeah, he uh, lost to uh, Laksha Sen at Demagoban. That's right. Oh. yeah, in the first round, sixteen and twelve. 16 and 12. But yeah, it's good to see him back in, in uh, winning ways, even if it was uh, with a bit of a controversy uh, in that uh, in that final. Uh, he lost the Hong Kong Open final some years ago against uh, Lee Chuck Yu with a lot of controversy on the uh, the, the final call where he uh, he killed it and was called fault. So like maybe this was uh, was uh, just karma. Yeah. So he, he got it back in uh, in this one. Uh, so now uh, karma owes one for, uh, for Chiu. But at least Joe, yeah. he has uh, he has tried winning high low before. He won it three years in a row, actually. So it's not. I don't think he will uh, lose a lot of sleep over not winning this particular title. Of course, it's annoying and frustrating uh, being uh, cheated uh, that way in twenty two all. But no one is saying that he would have won the title even if he uh, he had uh, not been called a fold on that point. He could have it's still just... lost. I just feel like uh, you should be able to challenge those calls. It's the mm. same with the net kill. If yep. the racket is over or not, uh, this is the same. Did the shuttlecock touch the ground or not? I don't really see why you can't, uh, can't challenge these uh, things. I mean, the umpire should sit there with a screen and be able mm. to run it back and then decide for, for himself. Um, but yeah, hopefully that, that could happen in some time in the future because uh, it could avoid these uh, crazy mistakes at crazy times in, in the matches. Yeah, it's not like I want everything to be reviewed. I don't want the breaks all the time, but I definitely agree there should be some kind of possibility with the with the calls, especially the calls on the net where there's often on TV code there is a camera there anyway. So like it's very fast and it's very simple to see if someone is hitting the shuttle on the wrong side of the net or if they touch the net as well. Uh, so I think there are definitely some options there that VWF should look into on the TV court at least. Um, one yeah. thing I will say though is that this is a Super 300 tournament, so I also don't expect like all these things at all events. Uh, maybe Super 300, it should still be there as well. Um, but I would say for me personally that it's it's mostly at Super 500 level and above that I expect uh, every every piece of technology to be uh, accessible actually. Um, we also need to remember it does cost a lot of money to do all these kind of things with the whole guy and stuff like that. Uh, but one good thing is that next year, I know from Super 750 and upwards, there will be two TV cords. So that's one thing we've asked for. 
Um, so there will be more matches televised. So I think people with in general is thinking about stuff like this. Um, but yeah, I still, I just still think we are far away from what is, uh, what is an acceptable level uh, as opposed to where we should be. Yeah, I agree one one hundred percent. Um, I think I would expect uh everything to to be as professional as as possible for a world tour event, even though it's a, a super three hundred. I think the Bam the sport of badminton is it's 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 huge, even though it's um not very professional. It's still a huge sport, and I believe there is quite a lot of money in the sport. I think BWF is sitting on uh, I mean, they have quite quite good resources. So I think mm. we should. Uh, I think that's uh, that's fair that uh, that everything should be very professional at at a super three hundred uh, level. Mm. Yeah, well, let's just agree then. That should be the case. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I not going to argue against I, you. I think Hans Christian, um, the Australia Open is uh, is being played next week. There's also some tournaments in uh, in Europe as well, and uh, mm. maybe. Maybe not the World Tour Finals in China. I'm not hundred uh, percent like up to date with with that event. Mm. But since we've all already been on for for a little bit more than an hour, I believe mm. I think we should we should save the Australian Open and maybe also save the World Tour Finals for another episode. I agree. We definitely need to do a uh, a preview of the World Tour Finals. No doubt about that. And after the Australian Open, we will know who's qualified and who's not. So uh, let's agree on uh, on doing a uh, a preview of the uh, World Tour Finals in the exactly. next episode. That's a good exactly. cliffhanger. Yeah, it is. It is. And um, with that being said, I think uh, we're done for today. So thanks so much to. To the people watching, uh, as always, remember to subscribe to the Bamson Experience, uh, like this video, and uh, leave a comment. Um, let's uh, let's hear some of your opinions on all the stuff that we have been talking about today. A lot of drama we have been discussing, mm -hmm. so I assume that there's people with different viewpoints in the comment comment section as well. So so let us know. Uh, and uh, anything you want to add, Hans Christian? It was great seeing you again, Anas, and I think it really looks good with the uh, shorter hair, actually. You look a yeah. little bit younger, but I think you also look a lot nicer, and my wife is saying the same. Yeah, thank you very much. I mean, my mom is really happy with it as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, I think, um, I mean, beside everything that we have been talking about, I think my hair actually was like uh, the most recommended topic for the episode <laughs> today. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now we so talked about we it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, should I just give a quick explanation or something? Okay, sure. Who cut it? Why and where? <laughs> um. So, so this the story about the haircut is that um. Oh, now I activated Siri again. Uh, am I still here? <laughs> yeah, you're still here. Fuck. Am I still here? Yeah, yeah. You're still here. You're still here. Okay. The story about the hair is that uh, I've been thinking about it for a long time. I was getting frustrated with the long hair. Um, I had to wear a cap or something like that all the time. It was it was mm. getting super warm as well. Um, but the haircut cost uh, it costed me ten euros. It was uh, from a. I was in Spain for a few weeks uh, doing some rehab work, and uh, yeah, I went to to a barber there. Ten euros and uh, and you get this haircut. It, it was it was a very good price. They mm. they didn't really use the scissor much. It was only the machine. <laughs> And uh, <laughs> it was super easy. So in five minutes, I was a to total new person. So uh, it's great. It's it's a big relief, to be honest. I feel yeah. like much lighter. It's much more mm. convenient. Uh, I miss the look of the long hair or maybe mm. the, not the longest, at the, at the longest point, but at like, like, in, like the mid, mid length, if you can say yeah. that. Yeah. I, li I, li I like that better, to be honest, but this is very convenient. So yeah. I'm starting all over, as mentioned in the beginning of this episode. Yeah, all right. We'll see the uh, the judgment from all the viewers. I'm sure they will, uh, and there will be lots of comments in the uh, comment section about your hair. Yeah, I mean, there's uh, different opinions in my Instagram DMs. Yeah. That's for yeah. sure. We might have to uh, make a poll at some point where people can vote if it's a good look or not. <laughs> we'll do that at some point. Yeah. yeah. Well, Hans Christian, it was nice talking to you again and to the viewers. Uh, hope you enjoyed it, and see you in the next episode. Thank you, guys. Bye, bye, guys. Bye.